Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have this opportunity to be in this house, to worship you, to magnify your name. And Heavenly Father, as we just simply gather around your word right now, I pray that you'll just help us to listen to your words. I pray that you'll help us to hear your Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord God, that you'll just help Caroline as she uh, shares the thoughts that you've placed upon her heart and her mind. And I pray, Lord God, that you'll give her the confidence to be able to say the words that she has to say this morning with, with boldness and with truth that comes from you. And so I pray, Lord God, that you will just uh, be with us this morning as we focus on you and we allow you to speak to us. We pray for those who are away uh, from us today, Lord God, wherever they are, whatever they're doing, we pray, Lord God, that you'll be with them and that you will give them more of your grace and your mercy and your peace, we ask in your precious name, Lord God. Amen. Thank you. Um, I do apologize. I am slightly nervous. I'm very, very unaccustomed to this sort of thing. Um, so firstly, I think I'm probably just going to echo that opening prayer that, that the words that you hear aren't my words, but they're God's words. Um, because having been given a topic like rooted in faith, that seems to imply that I might know something about faith and depth of faith and challenges to faith and all of those sorts of things. Um, so I really don't feel like I'm necessarily the right person to be doing that because my faith is pretty ropey at times. It's pretty shaky. It's pretty uncertain. Um, it's not always very coherent. And I certainly haven't got any stories of times when I've been faced up uh, with challenges or I've had to stand up for my faith or it's been putting me in positions of persecution. So I'm afraid I don't have any of those nice dramatic stories of opening that these sorts of talks maybe should come with. So I am going to open with the definition of faith, just because I don't know if anyone has got a sweepstake out there as to when Hebrews chapter 11 is going to come up. It's coming up now. Hebrews 11 verse 1, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And I think for me, so much of faith is having to trust in things which we don't really have any tangible sense of, that we don't really, we can't really put our finger on, but we just have to trust, and we just have to trust God. And we've obviously got lots of very good reasons to trust God, and the Bible is full of loads of promises. They're not necessarily promises that we're going to have an easy time of it, or you become a Christian and all of a sudden all of your problems are going to disappear and you'll win the lottery and things like that. And actually, there's an awful lot of stories in the Bible about people who suffered very much for their faith. Jeremiah being thrown into cisterns, Daniel being thrown in the lion's den, Paul, who describes at great length in several of his letters the sorts of things that he's endured for his faith. So I don't want to say, uh, because we have faith, because we trust God, everything is going to be fine. But there are plenty of places where it does tell us that we can rely on God who is with us to the end of the age. He will comfort us in our suffering. He will give us peace. And that we won't be tempted beyond what we can endure doesn't mean to say that we're not going to have to endure stuff. So people have got so many different experiences of faith and their understanding of how they can come to learn to trust God. And the, the big dramatic one that we think about is Paul's experience on the road to Damascus blinding light, hearing from God. Um, I suppose an example like that makes it very, very clear who it is that you're thinking about and the power that he has. I think other people have got a much more subtle, calm certainty to that. I'm thinking in particular of the church that uh, we used to go to, and one of our friends there said that she just knew from, she thinks she must have been about five, but maybe even younger, that God was real, and she just knew that God loved her, and she loved Jesus, and that was all she was going to follow for the rest of her life. Um, that's, you know, that would be absolutely amazing. I have to say, my, my experience of faith is nothing like that. It's also nothing like the faith of the centurion that we, we read about in Luke chapter 7. Um, so, Having asked Jesus to come and save his dying servant, he then sent friends with a message to Jesus to say, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. 
I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. This is somebody who, however he has come to this belief, has such a clear understanding of God's power and his love and his concern that he can just say, you, you, don't, you don't need to come and visit and do anything. You just need to be there. So, yeah, my faith is nothing like that either, I'm afraid. I have, I have a massive envy of people's experiences like that. I have, I have a faith of kind of reluctant acceptance of it. I know it's true. I don't necessarily like all of it, but I can't not believe. So, and I don't have this sense of certainty. I don't have this sense of, if you do this, everything will be all right. I'm still trying to work out what the plan God has for my life is. I think he's probably got one because we're told that and lots of other people tell me that there are plans for their life, so I have to assume it covers me as well. So I'm having to come from this, from it isn't about how much faith you've got and it isn't about how you come to that belief, but it's then what you do with it. So I'm now going to think about the flip side of faith, which is, for me, doubt. And I don't think we can shy away from it because I think it happens to us all. I hope it does. It may be that there's just a minority of us, but... For those of us that it happens to, it happens. And I don't think it's necessarily a problem because I believe that God is big enough to tolerate our doubts and he's big enough to have us stand there and say, I don't like what's going on. I'm not sure about this. I don't understand. There are huge numbers of Psalms where they talk about people really crying out to God and challenging him and, and what's, what's going on in their life and how that fits in with a loving God. So I think doubt to a certain extent, doesn't stop us being used by God at all. It certainly doesn't stop us being loved by God. Going back to Hebrews 11, there's the story of Abraham and Sarah who are marked out as of pillars of faith. Now, if you look back to the, uh, the passages in Genesis, Abraham is somebody who had multiple encounters with God. He described in terms of the Lord said to him, the Lord appeared to him. This is somebody who clearly knew who God was, had clearly spent time with God, not in some vague nebulous, I sat in church and I felt a slightly warm, fuzzy feeling. You know, he, he had actual encounters with God. God's promises to bless him, to give his descendants land, revisits those covenants, re-emphasize the covenants that he was going to have children despite his old age. And, God, and, and Abraham, who knew God well and had all of these conversations with him, decided to help God out a little bit regarding his promise of having children and took matters into his own hands and, and tried to continue his family line through Hagar, Sarah's servant. So he knew God. God had spoken to him very clearly. But he and Sarah laughed when they were told about having children due to their age. But even so... God kept his promises, um, and I've just written down the wrong verse there. Um, and so from this, one, from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. So Abraham and Sarah still doubted what God could do, and yet they were blessed abundantly by him. And yes, as I say, were, were pillars of faith. The other person who comes to mind for me when we think about doubt is Thomas. Now, we don't have a lot of information about Thomas in the Bible. There's the very, very well-known bit where he doubts the risen Lord because he didn't have the experience of him. And before this episode, there's one little passage in John where um, Thomas is with Jesus and the disciples before they return to Jerusalem. And Thomas says, let us also go that we might die with you. Now, my reading of this, if it came from anyone other than Thomas, we would be saying, wow, what a great sign of faith and commitment. What a rallying cry to encourage everyone. Um, but I think sometimes our preconceptions of what Thomas's character is like, from the fact that he is known as Doubting Thomas, I always associate with this slightly sort of resigned pessimism, this sort of Eeyore type, oh, we might as well go, so we'll die with you. 
So we've got this person who doubted Jesus, but God did great things through him. He's, he's one of the people who's named as one of the apostles. He was chosen. He's not one of the other believers. Um, and he's also part of the slightly more select group who were present at the beach um, of Galilee after Jesus was resurrected. It's described at the end of John's, uh, John's Gospel, where they have that lovely barbecue on the beach. Um, and he's also one of the core group of the early church who's mentioned in Acts. So this is somebody who had massive, massive doubts about Jesus, wasn't going to believe it until he'd seen him and touched, touched the wounds in his side himself, but yet he goes on to be one of the founding members of the early church. I'm just going to read a passage from this bit, bit of a plug for the book called Paradoxology, um, about coming through periods of doubt which makes your faith stronger, um, saying that it's important for our faith to be challenged and for us to actually work through some of those doubts. Um, so partly I'm using the book because I'd just like to recommend it. It's, it's written um, by a bloke called Krish Kandia who is involved with um, Tear Funds and the London School of Theology. And it's got lots of passages in it about the fact that it is only by wrestling with the challenges of faith rather than trying to pin them down or push them away that we can really come to know God individually and together. So partly it's a bit of a plug for the book because I think it's really good. Um, it also summarizes this passage much better than I could. And it also means that if you disagree with what I'm saying, then you can take it up with him rather than with me afterwards. <coughs> okay, so the Old Testament scholar... Walter Brueggemann, describes a three-stage process in the life of faith. At first, it is securely orientated, but then God shocks us with some unexpected turn of events, and our faith becomes painfully distort, disorientated. Thirdly, though he says that faith can be reoriented, often in surprising ways. Many Christians spend most of their lives in the first phase, securely oriented in their faith. They have a way of understanding how Christianity fits into their lives or how their lives fit in their Christian faith. They don't dig too deep into what they believe or why. They can just go along with what their favorite author, preacher, or Christian friend says. Everything is all okay. But then they experience a disruptive event, something they never saw coming, personal suffering, the fall from grace of their favorite preacher, a toxic experience of church, or simply a question that wobbles their understanding of one particular doctrine. They now experience exactly that painful disorientation. This unexpectedly and disconcerting, sorry, this unexpected and disconcerting experience can and does lead some to drop out of church altogether. It seems their faith is broken and there is no way or will to fix it. But we have seen in Abraham, Moses, Job and Hosea that the disruptive events God initiated in their lives did not demolish or debilitate their faith, but actually deepened it. This is the third phase, the surprising reorientation. Building an anti-fragile faith does not mean finding a way to avoid or navigate around the challenges that will come our way, but rather finding a way to see through them to something greater on the other side. God deliberately destabilizes and unsettles us, his children, not out of spite, but with the intention of helping us to reach a new level of integrity, intimacy, and humili humility through the process. So that gives me great encouragement, actually, that having questions about faith and having doubts and having areas that we're not sure on is, is something that can draw us to do more. And I suppose that means that we can pray with the father of the child of the evil spirit that's described in Mark chapter 9, I believe, help my unbelief. So going back to the topic of being rooted in faith, what, what does this mean for us? Now, I suspect that over the course of this series, there are going to be a number of gardening type images coming. My personal choice for this one um, is in Revelation 22, where, we, where there's the description of the river of life flowing through the new Jerusalem. And it talks about the tree of life on either side of the river. And I imagine this with the roots going down into this life-giving water. And I have a similar image um, when I think about trees growing on mountainsides and cliffs. I, I like walking. I think hills are good for the soul. And every so often you come across this really sheer rock face. And there's 
a tree that has somehow managed to find some nutrients in the cracks between the rocks. And so it's clinging onto the rocks, but it's also growing out from the rocks to actually reach further into the light. And so I suggest that being rooted in faith is like this. So with our roots in our trust in God, we're then in a position to reach out from where we are to actually make a difference. And so that's trusting in God to look after us. In whatever way that is, through whatever nightmarish things we're going through, that God is still with us. And it's to enable us to reach out in love and to show God's love and to show it generously and, and extravagantly as he loved. So that brings us around to what we should do. And obviously, I think that depends on what God wants us to do. Um, you know, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. I believe that every single one of us have got unique talents or gifts or desires placed in us by God to use for his service. And we should be using them. Now, I'm absolutely not suggesting we take blind, stupid leaps. Um, when Jesus was tempted in the desert before his ministry started, he was warned very exp expressly not to test God. But I think that we should be considering prayerfully what to do. We have to consider the situation that we're in. We have to consider what needs there are and how those can overlap. But we also have to be aware of the fact that it's going to be God's timing, not ours, and that can be excruciating for us all. One of the worship songs that we, we sing from time to time, I think, puts it beautifully. It's the, the one called Breathe on Me, Breath of God. And it, it, we, we pray that you awaken the song that you placed in my heart. Spirit, breathe on me. And I think that's very much the case, that, that wherever we're at in our journeys of faith, wherever we're at in our levels of professional Christianity or whatever, there are things that we can do and there are things that God has placed in our own heart that is for us to do. We can think of all sorts of examples from the scriptures, um, from what people do when they are rooted in faith. So some people may choose to follow the Great Commission to make disciples of all, of all nations. Some people may be called to be fishers of men. Some people may be inspired by the passage from Isaiah 61 that Jesus read in the temple to bring good news to the poor or to bind up the brokenhearted. For some people, it might be about showing hospitality, inviting people into your house, even or you know, maybe especially those who are excluded in society, the people who aren't so popular, who are outcasts, who are widows or children or vulnerable. Some people should be maybe inspired by the early church generosity and giving, whether that's financially or just things like time and serving the church. Sometimes I think the things that people are called to is not necessarily so outward looking, but no less valid because of that. Sometimes that might be the strength to to bear intolerable circumstances with grace. And in some cases, John Schofield isn't here today, but I'm going to say it anyway, walking in joy through those circumstances. For other people, it may be prayer, which again is, is less tangible, but this is one of those things that really underpins all the other ministries in the church, underpins everything that we do, and we should be doing more of it. So, so if we are rooted in faith, we should be thinking about carrying out these acts of love for the sake of the kingdom. And that might take some courage. Uh, quite a while ago, there was a book, I think, which I've never read, but I quite like the title of, called If You Want to Walk on the Water, You've Got to Get Out of the Boat. Um, and I think it is one of those things that we can get to the best intentions and everything, but in order to make changes in our society, in our world, we actually have to then do something. And hopefully we'll be doing something that we will have used our God-given wisdom to ask the right questions about what we should be doing and the timing of it. And we should have used our God-given discernment to recognize God's answers. So everything that we're doing will be building God's house. We will be singing the song that he's placed in our hearts. So we need to hold on to that trust that we have in God and that somehow through whatever messy things there are, he will ensure that all things are coming together for the overall good of those who love God. Again, I don't think that's one of those promises that 
everything is going to work out all right for you as a person, but for, for God's plan, yes, it will. And I suppose that's, the, that's then the stage where we maybe are making small steps, like extending the hand of friendship or, or forgiveness, which may be even harder. It may be things like, it may be big lifestyle changes. It may be that some people are being called to go and do something which does seem a bit crazy, very dramatic, turning their, their life on as they know it on their heads. For other people, it might be more like having that slightly awkward church conversation with colleagues or neighbours and inviting people to come to things. And I am possibly looking at myself when I say that. Um, and I suppose if, if, if the bits that I've spoken about regarding the doubts about God or the doubts about God's plans or the doubts as to whether or not he's really that trustworthy, if they're the bits that seem to resonate with you, it may just be something as simple as taking a really small step into his arms because I think he longs for us to start that journey. So, thank you very much. <laughs>